Northern Scotland has some really classic geology and its centrepiece is the Moyne Thrust Belt. So let's go and explore some of the structure of the Thrust Belt together. We'll look at two aspects. We'll look at its geometry, the sorts of features we can deduce by making observations at an outcrop scale, and then we'll go and look at how the rocks have responded to being stacked up by thrusts. We'll look at the rock deformation. So where are we talking about? Well, Northern Scotland, or at least the mainland of Scotland, has a great variety of geology dominated by the roots of the old Caledonian mountain belt. And the margins of that mountain belt on its western side is the Moyne Thrust and its Moyne Thrust belt. There it runs from the north coast up at Durness all the way down for 200 plus kilometers off the bottom of this map and over to the Isle of Skye and beyond. So what we can do is go and have a look at some of the rocks involved in these structures. One of the really useful things about the geology of the area is the rocks involved are regular and recognisable. By regular, that means that the rocks more or less retain the same thickness and aspect so that we can uh, make some simple deductions of the structure as we go. And we'll have a look at that as we, as we move around the area. But let's have a look at how they're represented at outcrop. And here at Knockham Crag, we can see a regular stratigraphy moving up the hillside with the Moyne rocks on top. And the contact there in red is the Moyne thrust. So here, the thrust belt is just represented by one thrust, the Moyne thrust. We can see it on cross sections, this classic one by the Geological Survey, um, drawn uh, in the start of the 20th century. And we're looking at this frontal area here, where only one thrust exists at the front. That outcrop was down there at Knocken, and there are various other places where the Moyne thrust belt is just one thrust. So it's just down here in front of the mountain Anchillok. So let's add some geology to the view. We can see that we've got stratigraphy coming out from the bottom of the, of the photograph up from the valley there at Torridonian, younging up through the Cameron Court sites. A little bit of stacking in the next units up at the Ants Ron, and then the Moyne thrust basically running over the top. So a very narrow tract of thrusting. We can compare that with behaviours elsewhere along the thrust belt. So when let's nip up to the, the, the northernmost part of the, of the region, up there by White and Head near the village of Durness. Some pretty spectacular sea cliffs up here. So let's look at the geology on it. We can recognise repetitions of the brown fucoid beds forming the bedded units on the cliff. And picked out in yellow is a very distinctive band of, of quartz sandstones, the Salterella grit. And they occur three times, repeating um, themselves with thrust structures that put fucoid beds repeatedly onto the Salterella grit. So imbrication that we can recognise because of the very simple stratigraphy. And the imbrication just involves this small package of the strata. Now let's go further, uh, slightly further south, to the head of Loch Erebol, into this region here. And here's a cross section drawn through this ground, which shows a rather different structural style to the one we've just been looking at, where the stratigraphy, or a very large part of it, is stacked up on a series of widely spaced thrusts. This is the ground um, that cross section runs through, very classic country, and um, on these snowy cliffs you can pick out a whole stack of thrust repetitions of several tens of meters of stratigraphy stacked up again and again and again. Here's a modern cross section through there uh, showing the style of stacking where lots of thrust structures pile up together to thicken the, stra the stratigraphic unit, these quartzites, um, to bulge up the Moyne thrust and create the structures that we see today. Now, if you step back from that, the far skyline is the ridge with the cross section. Um, in the relative foreground, we can see a hillside. It's uh, five or six kilometers of view there, and almost all of it is the unit called the Pipe Rock, the stratigraphic thickness of which is 75 or 80 meters. That's all. So there's an awful lot of stacking going on here. Let's pick out some thrusts, and we can see these major thrusts arching through the landscape, that complexity. Of pattern relates to the interaction with the landscape. 
Let's go and have a look at how we can identify these structures. So zoom in on one of them and we can recognize the thrust structures by their ramps. Here we can see a discordance. The geologist is hunkering down in the foot wall, being overridden by a thrust slice that we can see there. But it's not just this scale of thrusting that exists on this hillside. We zoom in onto this stream section in here, you can see that an individual bed has been stacked up again and again in a series of imbricates. And if we zoom in even closer still, we can see that just a few centimetres of beds have been stacked up into this rather, rather nice little duplex structure as well. So there's imbrication within this system on all scales. This area is it's a bit of a thrust tectonics playground, so it's a really great area for seeing the scalar stacking. And um, the interesting thing about this is if you try and unravel the section based on the idea that, it's a, that the stratigraphy is only about 80 metres originally, this whole area unravels to an original width in excess of 50 kilometres. OK, so much for those areas up in the north. Let's go right down to the southern end of the Moy Thrust Belt here on this map uh, near the village of Torridon. And in this area here, the structure involves the underlying Torridonian sandstone. In this particular case, these hills show some really spectacular structures. Let's look at the cross section in here. And you can see the brown Torridonian rocks stacking the units up. And the, the, the thrust slices are quite widely spaced and very thick. So let's jump up to the middle part of the thrust belt around the famous Ascent district. And in these locations, there's some pretty dramatic thrust slices that involve the basement, the Louisian Nice. The thrust comes through here. So this is the Glen Cool thrust. It's a very famous structure, um, well described by Peach and others um, a long time ago. And this is Peach's cross section. Let's look at a more recent one. It shows the same thing. You've got the thrust of carrying the Louisian basement over the Cambrian strata, and the Cambrian strata are imbricated beneath. So we can see that on this zoom in. And the Glencore thrust truncates these little imbricate slices um, as it's been emplaced. So, so there's some questions we want to ask of this, this region. So let's we can use the structures, the earlier structures, carried in the thrust slice to do some analysis. And one of the questions we want to ask is how has the Glen Cool thrust moved? Did it move as a simple translation or did it did it rotate its thrust sheet as it went? Well the trend of the pre-Cambrian structures in this basement could be used to answer that question because out here on the foreland we can recognize a suite of these green stripes on the map. These are, these are sub-vertical um, old dike structures they're um, protozoic in age and uh, they trend in this sort of northwest southeast direction picked out on the uh, on the map and we can also find them in the thrust sheet here and have the same trend so therefore the thrust sheet was in place without any rotation around vertical axes Next question we can ask is how far has the Glencore sheet moved? So that white box is the area we were considering, and you can still see all those those stripes of scoury dikes out in the uh, foreland area. The thrusting direction, as we'll see shortly, was towards the west northwest. Now the tr there's a, a structural break in the foreland you can pick out on the northern part of the map where the where the, the stripiness changes from green to red, and those that represents a Precambrian structure called the Laxford Front. The Laxfordian deformation is really quite spectacular and easily recognised in outcrop. So we can take that Laxford front and project it downtrend into the heart of the Northern Highlands, continuing at depth beneath the Moines sheet. We can recognise the same feature in the Glencore thrust sheet offset by that thrust. So if we say the thrusting direction was towards the west-northwest, the piece of Laxford front that we see in the thrust sheet has come from back here to the, from, the, uh, from the east. And by looking at the scale of the map, we see that the displacement on that thrust sheet is approximately 30 kilometers. So quite a big thrust. We can step back and do the same thing across Scotland, to do uh, at least northern Scotland, and look at how far these thrust sizes have moved. And those green blobs in the middle of the northern highlands show where thrust sheets in the ascent area have come from showing the scale of displacement uh, 
on the thrust. So let's, we can wrap up and conclude our understanding of thrust geometry on the large scale. And although the stratigraphy was regular, recognisable, simple, pretty uniform across the region, there's a highly variable response in the thrust belt. In some places, the thrust belt is just marked by the mine thrust alone, without any other structures involved. In other places, we've seen that we get single formation imbrication, just in those cases, stacking up the Fucoid beds and Salterella. In other places, all beds imbricate in all scales, as we saw on the, the hills to the south of Loch Erebol. In other places, again, we see we get space thrusts as the Torridonium becomes involved, making a widely, widely spaced large scale imbricate system. And we get Lewisian basement sheets also carried along in the thrust system. So a highly variable response. So what do these thrust zones actually look like and how do the rocks respond to all this displacement? Well, that outcrop there is the mine thrust itself. And we'll come back to that in a minute because what's interesting is that the burrows in the pipe rock represent fantastic strain markers for charting deformation. So here we're looking side onto some bedding. The lens cap is sitting on a, a, a just long bedding plane and you can see those deflected stripy shapes, which are the burrows, which near the lens cap are perpendicular to bedding. And But as you come down through the bed unit, they deflect over to about 45 degrees, reflecting a shear strain, well, a shear strain of one. So we can use the burrows to quantify the amount of bed parallel simple shear in the fashion you can see here. So it's a way of charting the actual strain. So as the shearing increases, the angle made between bedding and the pipes decreases until at very high strain, everything becomes parallel and smeared out by the thrusting. So we can go and look at this up at the stack of Glen Cool. So here we are looking back into the thrust belt. The thrusts are coming towards us. We're going to go up to the top of the hill here. This is the stack of Glen Cool. We're looking into the thrust direction. Well, let's look side on. And here's the stack of Glen Cool side on in here. Well, let's add some geology to this. The stack contains the Moyne thrust, which we can see here. The Moyne rocks are carried over quartzites, these quartz sandstones. So if we zoom in onto the contact in here, this is what we see. We see the Moyne rocks, they're monetized, highly sheared. We'll talk about those in a minute. And some similarly sheared quartz sandstones underneath. Look how streaky they look um, around the compass there. So strong shearing everything's been parallelized. So if we look down on that fabric, it's a planar fabric, but we look down on it, we can identify the pipes. They're those streaks that we can see running across the slide parallel to the red pencil. And they use those, and the pencil more or less lies along where the, the pipes are. They started off perpendicular, so sticking straight out of the ground, and they've now been smeared right over, rather like being swept over by, by trees in a gale. So swept out in the direction of shearing. So it's that is what part of the evidence, very strong evidence, for the shearing direction on the Moyne thrust. It's towards the west-northwest. And this is what's happened to the rocks on a grain scale. So in an undeformed state on the left-hand side, well, these little views, these photomicrographs are about um, two or three millimeters across, and you can see the grains on the, on the first one, they're beginning to deform. They've got undulose extinction, forming that stripiness. But the grain shapes are still broadly sedimentary. But as you look at what happens in the marlinitic quartzite, those grains have been strongly modified, their shapes, their, their so-called ribbon grains, strung out by the deformation, by crystalline plasticity. Well, these ideas were first proposed by, by, by Lapworth in the 1880s, and his type area was the Arnabal thrust up in the northern part of, uh, of uh, the thrust belt on the sides of Loch Erebol. It's one of these structures that puts Lewisian basement on top of quartz sandstones. Let's zoom in a bit. Here's the contact up by the red box there. And we've got strongly altered Lewisian, that sort of green mucky stuff, and the sheared pipe rock beneath. Well, let's look at the sheared pipe rock. Those are the trends of the pipes, clearly no longer perpendicular to bedding. They started off perpendicular to bedding, but with shearing have become deflected over, again, giving us the sense of shear on, and the direction um, of displacement of the overriding Lewisian thrust sheet. 
So let's think about the, the altered Lewisian. Well, we can do a profile into that shear zone, and this is some photomicrographs. Again, you can see the scale of this, and this is for a, from a sort of pegmatitic bit of the of the Wisdom basement with still recognizable grains. They're still fairly reasonable size. Um, they break up and shear as you approach the thrust itself, but then as you get really close into that green muck that was along the thrust plane like that, they become intensely foliated, as you can see with that streaky fabric, and the grain size is really strongly reduced as the shearing has progressed. So a feature of the marlinites in the Lewisian is you change the minerals into these very platy, browny, streaky colours in these representations, which are phyllosilicates, and you so you've recrystallized the material into new minerals. There's a chemical reaction gone on, but also you've reduced the grain size. And the effect is to make a weak rock that can accommodate the displacement. So new minerals and grain size reduction create these highly foliated uh, rocks, myelinites. But not all the faults around the Moines thrust belt of myelinites by any means. So if we go back to these one of these quartzite fault zones, um, here it is again. Take the myelinites away. This is what this fault zone looks like. So we've got in the photomicrograph at the top there, three millimeters, you can see that we've got a rock flower. It's been ground down, crushed and broken. Um, the sort of fault rock called a cataclasite. And in, in outcrop that you can see in the bottom slide, that you can see this sort of blue mottling we, we called it bruising. It looks like a bruised rock. Well, that, what that is, is a highly cemented, compacted rock flower. So the, it's those blue bits are what the, uh, what the aspects of the calicase light is in outcrop. And that's what it looks like in thin section. So the grain size reduction here is not caused by crystalline plasticity, but by crushing and milling. So two diff really distinctive types of fault rocks. They're classic distinctions of one is deformed by crystalline plasticity, the myelinites, the other one is by grain breaking, the cataclasites. And they occur in rather special different places in the thrust belt. The cataclasites occur here in the later structures, the more outlying structures um, on the cross section. The myelinites have been lifted up from deeper at depth uh, in the earlier form structures, such as the moid thrust. So there we have it, a quick exploration of some of the structures in the Moin Thrust Belt. We've looked at the geometry, we've seen how the simple stratigraphic template has responded in many different ways to create a large variations in structure. The individual components are rather simple, but they combine in complex fashions. There's a huge range in the style of scale of, of thrusting from imbrication on the bed or sub-bed scale right up to the major basement sheets. And the deformation also shows variation from myelinitic shear zones in the earlier formed structures onto the cataclastic fault zones of the later quartz imbricates um, fault zones. So if you'd like to find out more about this, all these classic sites are described in the Geological Conservation Review uh, published by John Mendham and others in 2009 and it also concludes an introduction to the thrust belt. So you can find out more by seeking out that volume.